Hi everyone. In this experiment, I want to talk a little bit about um, experiment eight on gravimetric analysis. But what experiment eight is, although you're going to use gravimetric analysis to do the experiment, what experiment eight is really about is it is about um, sampling error. So let's take a look at what we're talking about when we talk about sampling error. So if we have a solution, right, in a container, something like this, sorry, I should put it on the screen. We have some solution. And let's say that this contains um, 18 milliliters of water or 18 milliliters of solution, because that's about one mole of solution if it's water, okay? If we take from this solution um, one milliliter, we will take 1 18th of the solute. So if there's one gram of solute in this entire solution, it will mix easily evenly. And if we take one milliliter of it, we'll take one eighteenth of that one gram, whatever that comes out to be. And the reason for this is that if we have 18 milliliters of an aqueous solution and it's relatively dilute, this is approximately one mole of solution or water. So it's about one mole of water in 18 milliliters of solution because the density of water is one gram per milliliter about and um, the molar mass is 18 grams. So this is about one mole of solution, which means that there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23 particles in this solution. So there is a massive number. And if we take 1 18th of this, if you divide this by 18, it's still a massive number. Said another way, that the statistics work out because the sample size is huge. So even a small portion of an aqueous solution, the sample size is still massive. You could divide this by 1 200th, which is probably about as little as you could um, easily get, all right, without using a, a very, uh, small pipette. Even if you divide this by 200, it's still times 10 to the 21, right? So it's still a huge, huge number of particles. And since there's a huge number of particles, the sampling size or the, the sample size is big and therefore the statistics work out. So if we take 1 18th of this, we'll take 1 18th of the solute as well. Now let's look at when we have a solid. And when we have a solid, we're going to use, um, uh, in this case, three different solids. First thing we're going to do is we're going to take sodium sulfate, Na2SO4, and you're going to take about 0 0.75 grams of sodium sulfate. And we're going to mix it with one of three types of salt. Each group will be assigned a type of salt by the, C, uh, by the TA, and then you're going to have to compare among groups uh, to see about the sampling error. So you're going to use, in your case, NaCl, and you're going to use about 15 grams. But there's three sizes of salt, or said another way, there's three numbers of particles. So the first is what we call a chemical grade, which is just we bought it from Fisher. Okay, I'm not sure that we bought it from Fisher, but we bought it from a chemical company. All right, chemical grade, this is kind of small particles. Then we have kosher which is our medium particles. And then we have rock salt, whoops, which is our large particles. And in this case, you, you may even be able to count the number of particles in each of your three samples. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take 0.75 grams of sodium sulfate and 0.75, uh, 0.75 grams of sodium sulfate and 15 grams of one of these three types of sodium chloride. You're then going to do your best um, to mix them together using a spatula or whatever you think is going to mix them effectively. Apparently I have an update available, okay? And then you're going to break it into three samples. Now it's very important that you know the exact mass of this because you're not going to take exactly 0.75 grams and the exact mass of this to four decimal places because that's what you have in the in the lab and that you take four decimal places um, for each of the three samples so that you can calculate how much sodium sulfate should be in each of the samples.
So now the question becomes, well, how the heck are we going to figure out how much of it is sodium sulfate and how much of it is sodium chloride? And to do that, what we're going to do is use a double displacement reaction, in which case um, one thing will precipitate and one thing will not. So what you're going to want to do to do this is you're going to want to make 250 milliliters of 0 0.5. 075 molar barium chloride, BaCl2, which is aqueous. And I'll leave it to you to figure out how to make that. Okay, and you're going to react about twice as much as you need with each of these three samples using one of the salts. Remember, you're going to make this as an overall bulk sample, mix it together, and then break it into three portions that are approximately equal. Well, what's going to happen here? Well, we have two possible reactions. We have BaCl2 aqueous reacting with Na2SO4 aqueous. And we have potentially BaCl2 aqueous reacting with NaCl aqueous. So what happens? Well, these are double displacement reactions. The positive ion, the metal ion, goes with the negative ion. In this case, the sulfate's the anion, like this. And Na goes with Cl. In this case, the same thing. Ba goes with Cl. Na goes with Cl. So looking at the top example, we have Ba, 2 plus, it's a 2A metal. Sulfate is SO4, 2 minus, we cross them. And we get Ba2SO4, 2, but since they're both 2, we cancel them out, and we get BaSO4. It turns out that barium sulfate, sulfates are generally soluble, but barium's an exception. So this is a solid, which precipitates. Now we end up with Na and Cl. You probably already know what it is, but it's Na plus Cl minus. We cross them, and we get NaCl aqueous. And sodium chloride, chlorides are generally soluble. Sodium salts are always soluble. So this is what we end up with. Now to balance this, we have two sodiums and two chlorides. So we need two NaCl's. In the next case, we have barium going with chloride. So we have Ba2 plus Cl minus. Cross them and we get, whoops, so yields BaCl2 aqueous. We again get Na and Cl, which is just NaCl aqueous. And what you notice is we just have ions floating around in solution. Said another way, both products are aqueous. Chloride salts, it's here it's aqueous, chloride salts are generally soluble. Barium is no exception. So the better answer to this is simply no reaction. So at the end of the day, we will precipitate any sodium, um, any sulfates out of solution, but we will not precipitate the sodium chloride. Said another way, we can ultimately figure out how much, using stoichiometry, sodium sulfate was originally in solution by um, basically doing this double displacement reaction, measuring the mass of barium sulfate that's obtained, doing stoichiometry to find the mass of the original sodium sulfate in the sample. And when we do all that work, what we end up with is the mass of sodium sulfate in each of our three samples. Now there's a couple practical things that you need to worry about when you're doing this reaction. Barium sulfate will form a very fine powder if you let it. So after you've divided your uh, three samples up, you need to slowly add the 0.75 molar barium chloride. And when we say slowly, that means over about 15 minutes. Then you're going to filter it using a pre-weighed sintered glass funnel. Note that in your three samples, you're not going to be able to get them to be exactly the same mass. So what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to 
um, know which one is which. So make sure that you know which sample is which. So now that we have a general idea of what's going on in this experiment, what I want to talk about next is another example using potassium sulfate, okay, um, for how you can actually calculate the mass of the original in our example potassium sulfate in each sample and how you can then compare that mass to the expected mass. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up an Excel, Excel sheet and we're going to work on um, working through the calculations of this experiment. So now what we want to do is look at this for um, potassium sulfate and potassium chloride. So in your case you're going to use around 0.75 grams of um, sodium sulfate and around 15 grams of sodium chloride. In my example, I'm using two grams approximately of potassium sulfate and 25 grams approximately of uh, potassium chloride. So it's a little bit different. And the first thing I want to do is I want to find the percentage of um, potassium sulfate in each sample. So to do that, I first want to find the total mass, which just equals this plus this. So now I have the total mass of the sample. Now I want to take the mass of the potassium sulfate divided by the total mass and multiply by 100 because it's a percentage. So in each of my three samples, so I'm going to take this approximately 27 grams of mixture and I'm going to break it into three samples. And the total mass of those three samples should be um, 27.0599 grams. Now how exactly you're going to do that, you can read in the lab manual. I'm not going to talk about that here, but here are the masses of my three samples of solid mixtures. Notice yours are going to be lower um, because you're going to only have somewhere around 15.75 grams, and I have around 27 grams. The next thing I have here is the mass of the crucible. So before, I take the dry crucible before I do the filtration. And then finally, I have the mass of the crucible, and this should say um, barium. There's a typo there. Barium sulfate. So I have the crucible and the precipitated barium sulfate after I do the filtration, and these are the masses in this case. Now what I want to find is the experimental mass of barium sulfate. So I simply take the mass of the barium sulfate and the crucible, subtract out the mass of the crucible, hit enter, and I want to do that in all three cases. So I just drag it down. Now I want the experimental mass of potassium sulfate. And to do that, I want to show you the stoichiometry, although I'm actually going to do the calculation back here in Excel. So let's look at this reaction. So I have barium chloride reacting with potassium sulfate to form barium sulfate and 2KCl. So this is a balanced chemical equation, and now I have the molar masses. So if we look, in my first sample, I have 1.0 618 grams of barium sulfate and I want to ultimately figure out how many grams of potassium sulfate I have. So I want to go from grams of barium sulfate to moles of barium sulfate to moles of potassium sulfate to grams of potassium sulfate. So I want to do stoichiometry. Well, to convert from grams to moles, I use the molar mass, which I already wrote down here. I just looked it up on um, the, the internet. So it's 233.38 grams of barium sulfate on the bottom and one mole of barium sulfate on top. Now I want to convert it to potassium sulfate. Well, there's one potassium sulfate and one barium sulfate. So I put one mole of barium sulfate on the bottom and one mole of potassium sulfate on top. Now I want to convert it to grams of potassium sulfate using the molar mass. Well, in every one mole of potassium sulfate on the bottom, there are 174.26 grams of potassium sulfate on the top. So that's basically what I'm doing. If you notice here, what I want to do is I want to take the number that's in the Excel file, I want to divide it by the molar mass of barium sulfate, and then multiply it by the molar mass of potassium sulfate. Everything else 
is a 1. So I don't need to do that math. Now, if you want to type that all in, you can, but you don't have to. So I'm just simply going to divide by this and multiply by that. So to do that, I'm going to come over here into this Excel, and I'm going to do equals the mass of the original sample divided by the molar mass of barium sulfate, which is 233.38 times the molar mass of potassium sulfate, which is 174.26. Hit enter. And now it gives me the experimental mass of potassium sulfate in the sample. I can repeat that for the other three. Now I want to look at the expected mass of potassium sulfate in the sample. And to do the expected mass, I want to take the mass of the mixture that I took times the percentage of potassium sulfate in that mixture. So if I took around 9 grams and it's a 7.54% potassium sulfate, I can then figure out how much of this should be potassium sulfate. To do this, I take equals this number, the mass of the solid mixture, times the percentage as a number. So the percentage divided by 100. That will give it to me. Now, if you notice, if I try to pull this down, it's not going to work. And the reason it's not going to work is because this cell changed. So to fix that problem, I come here, I go to B4, and I put dollar signs around it, which you can do by simply hitting F4. Now it'll stay on that cell. The dollar signs mean don't move. So now I put them down. So now I could see the mass of the um, potassium sulfate that I should have gotten in each case. Now I want to calculate the percentage difference. So to do that equals the absolute value of the expected value or the theoretical value minus the experimental value divided by the accepted value times 100 because it's a percentage. And I get 13.9%. I bring that down and you can see that these are not perfect due to something called sampling error that we talked about earlier. Now I want to do the average percent difference, which is just the average of these three numbers. And I can hit enter, and my average percent difference is about 11%. There's a couple of other, other interesting things that we can um, calculate. Because maybe the percent difference is because we lost some of the potassium sulfate. Okay, maybe some of it didn't react or whatever the case may be. So let's find the total mass in each case. So in this case, I want to find the total experimental mass of potassium sulfate. So I want to add these all up. In this case, I want to find the total um, theoretical mass that I should have gotten if I got all of it. And you'll notice it is slightly different. So I somehow got a little bit extra. Okay, I can calculate the percent difference on this as well. And I find that it's only 3%. So overall, I've somehow gotten a little bit of extra mass, but the percent difference of the experimental masses to the expected masses for all samples is only 3%. The sampling difference is 11%, which again points to the fact that there's sampling error. Another thing that I could do is I could look at the statistics between the experimental and the expected masses. So here I can look at the average, which is average of these three numbers. And I can look at the average of the expected masses, which is the average. Or now that I'm thinking about it, I can just simply pull this over. Okay, and I can find the average of those masses. Standard deviation, the same thing, SDDEV, whoops, of the three experimental masses. And same thing for the expected masses, I can simply pull it over. And then for the RSD, it equals the standard deviation divided by the average times 1,000, because we do it in parts per thousand. I don't know why I have it as grams over there. And I can again pull that over. So this should be parts per thousand. Okay. And basically what we find is that there's less deviation in the expected masses and much more deviation in the experimental masses. This is 
this small deviation is because we have very close sample sizes. If we didn't have close sample sizes, we wouldn't expect a small deviation in the expected masses. But this is what we can do by trying to get the same sample size every time. We get about 20 out of 1,000 in deviation. But when we add in sampling error, now we're up to 145 out of 1,000. So all of, the, all of this experimental data points us to the fact that there is some sampling error here. Once you do all of this math for your samples, you can determine whether you think there's sampling error or if the error is mostly from the fact that the samples aren't all exactly the same size. And using your numbers, you can draw a conclusion on those two things. You should also talk to your lab mates in order to figure out if the small, medium, or large size of the sodium chloride uh, crystals makes any difference towards the sampling error. So I hope here I've given you a general idea of some of the math that you're going to need to be able to do um, in this experiment, as well as a general idea of what you're actually going to do. It's very important that you read through the lab experiment, especially the experimental procedure part, because we didn't talk in great detail of exactly what to mix together or how to mix it together or anything like that. There are some calculations you should do before you come, such as how do you make 250 milliliters of a 0.075 molar barium chloride solution. As always, you should also think about how you're going to divide and conquer um, this experiment. Um, remember that you're going to have to slowly add the barium sulfate, uh, the barium chloride mixture to the um, solid sample over about 15 minutes. So I would strongly recommend you don't do those one at a time, right? So you're adding a little bit to each of the uh, samples over 15 minutes all at the same time. So it costs you one 15 minutes instead of three 15 minutes. So I hope you found this video helpful and I do appreciate you watching.